Hallelujah. We'll praise him one more time. Bless the Lord. <clears throat> Remain standing with me, please, and turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We'll begin reading at verse 27. This is part of a story that is familiar to many of us. Jesus met a woman at a well. She had had five husbands, and the man she was living with was not her husband. But she had an encounter with Jesus. It just kind of does away with all the religious mindsets that you have to be perfect to know God or to meet God. Amen? And I want to pick up kind of the latter portion of that story, John 4, 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Let's stop right there. I was going to read a few more, but let's stop right there. In fact, let's go back to verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Do not say there's still four, do you not say there's still four months? Then comes the harvest. Behold, I say, lift up your eyes. And look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. I want to preach and share my heart with the Lord's help this morning on take action. Take action. Look over at somebody and tell them, take action. God, we thank you for gracing us with your presence. We do not take that lightly or for granted. Lord, Whatever we've come in here thinking we need this morning, there's healing in your presence. When we get in your presence, everything we have need of is found there. And God, I pray that you would touch hearts. I pray that we'd be yielded to you. Not coming up with excuses as to why we can't, but that we'd just surrender to you and say, yes, Lord. That we take the action we need to take. I pray for you to Anoint us in the listening. I pray for you to anoint me in the speaking. God, I can't do this without you. Please wrap me in the mantle of your glory and your anointing today. God, and confirm your word in power. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. God bless you and you may be seated. Somebody say, take action. Unfortunately, we are very guilty in the church of talking things to death. We'll talk about it all day long. A lot of times we just don't do it. In fact, you know, the most dangerous, sometimes we worry, oh, you can be 
they'll deceive you. The most dangerous deception is self-deception. And sometimes we deceive ourselves into thinking, especially when it comes to the claims of Jesus and the claims of the gospel, that because we have a head knowledge, because we have information, that therefore everything must be okay. And God must be pleased with us. And we're particularly guilty of that here in the Bible Belt of America, maybe the buckle of the Bible Belt, where we live that we think because we hear it or we know it or we talk about it, that therefore everything must be okay and that's all that's necessary. But there are times when God calls us to take action. You can talk it to death, but sometimes you got to do something with it. There's, there are some things that some of us have talked about or thought about or have known about for years, but the only problem is we've never done anything about it. The scripture tells us, James addressed it at least a couple of times or more. James said it's not enough just to be a hearer of the word, you have to be a doer of the word. James went so far as to say, faith without works is dead. That if you don't do something with it. So let me ask you this morning, what is there that you've known for a long time that you need to do something, but you've still not done anything with it? You're sitting here this morning and we have cultivated the ability. Our consciences have become so seared. We've been to so many services. We've listened to so many sermons. We've heard it so much that we think we must be okay, but we can listen to the most convicting preaching and even say amen and still go out and not do a hill of beans with it. And it doesn't make any difference in our lives. So whatever there is that God has let you know this is what you need to do, but you still haven't done anything with it. There comes a point Jesus was talking about it here. He had come to the earth. He was in his ministry. He has this encounter with the woman at the well. He begins to talk about the harvest and he understands and he conveys this to his disciples. It's not enough to just talk about it. It's not enough to just say, well, someday the fields, you know, we need to harvest the fields. No, it's time to take action. There's a harvest right here. I want to give you the city. I want to do something here and now. And I would tell you this, and of course it applies on a very practical level in all of our daily lives. For all of us, there's probably something. But I would submit to you, not only are there times when you and I need to take action, some of you need to quit talking about doing something with your marriage and get on the stick. And your spouse is praying to God you would. Some of us need to quit talking about a lot of things, but not only is it, are there times when we need to take action? There are times when God is ready to take action. When he may have spent years preparing. There are some of you, God has been working on you literally for years to get you to this point. Don't miss it now. It's time to quit talking about it and take some action. Look over at somebody and say, he's, he's preaching right to you. there are times when God is ready to take action. You know, we wrestle with that in Psalm 10. Even the psalmist questioned and said, God, why does it seem like you stand afar off? And why does it seem like you hide when trouble comes? And he cries out in Psalm 10, it was a call for action. He says, arise, O God. Arise, O oh God. Listen, it's time for the church to get up and say, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. We've talked about this thing long enough. It's time that we do something with it. There is a harvest. And there's only a certain window of opportunity. There were times when God acted. Galatians said that Jesus was born in the fullness of time. God had been setting that up for centuries, but there came a time to take action. 
The Bible said in the New Testament, I think Peter said, that if we humble ourselves before the Lord, that he will promote you and exalt you in due time. That there will come a time that he may have been setting you up for years to get you ready and to get things ready for you. But there comes a moment when he says, don't, just like in John 4, don't put this off any longer. It is time to take action and do something with this. And especially in light of the world in which we live and in the, t- the time in which we live, How many of you know God is looking for a church that will take action? I'm not talking about off somewhere. I'm not talking about New York City or L.A. I'm talking about Corbin, Kentucky. I'm talking about the Tri-County. I'm talking about at your address. I'm talking about at your house. Sometimes there's another another level of commitment. Sometimes that God has been dealing with you about a long time. Sometimes not only is it time for you to act, but... Things have come into alignment just like the eclipse we saw a few days ago that God has finally lined things up that God's ready to act and he's just inviting you to get on board with him. And when the, you remember the story, when the water's being troubled, it doesn't happen forever. You know, and if you won't do it, God will find somebody else. But he wants you to do it. There are a lot of us sitting here that God has invested an awful lot in you. I said, God's invested. Listen, you know why, and I'll get into some more of this here in a minute. You know why so many of us got so excited in here that song we were singing a few minutes ago about the, the mercy of God finding us? I'll tell you why. Because of the work God's done in this house, you may be visiting and you may not know it, but I guarantee if you reach out in one direction around you, you'll touch a former drug addict somewhere. You'll touch a former alcoholic somewhere that mercy found and Jesus got a hold of and made a difference. I'm going to preach a minute while I'm here. And he didn't save you because you're good looking. He didn't save you because you're talented. He didn't reach down into the pit that he dug you out of because you were smarter than anybody else. You didn't deserve it a bit more than a man on the moon. And he didn't save you just so you could warm a seat on Sunday morning. He expects you to get up and do something with it and take action. I appreciate it when you preach with me. All of us enjoy it a whole lot more. We worship over the word together and we celebrate the goodness of God. But the ultimate response is not just to say amen when the preacher preaches. The ultimate response is not even just to come to church on Sunday. You're not doing God a favor. We act like, oh yeah, I want to be a Christian. I'll go to church Sunday. Like that's ministry, like that's doing something for God. Baby, coming to church ain't ministry. Coming to church is a blessing. You ought to thank God you get to come to church and be in the presence of the Lord with his people. I'm talking about taking action. Jesus was a man of action. Now, I understand there's timing. Jesus prepared 30 years for three years of ministry. And some of you young adults need to understand that. Well, I don't, you know, I don't want to go here do this. Jesus prepared 30 years for three years of ministry. But there came a point, that doesn't mean he was just sitting twiddling his thumbs. There comes a time to take action. When he comes to this woman, I'm, I'm always struck. We don't have time to read the whole chapter, but I'm always struck by John 4 and 4. 
that says he needed to go through Samaria. Aren't you glad he needed to come by the hell hole where you were? He needed to come through Corbin. He needed to come through London. He said, I need it. He needed to go there. Now, you have to understand, when I talk about taking action, if you'll look on the screens, they're going to put a map up there. And this is a map of Israel during the time of Jesus. Now, Jesus was at this point in the text, Jesus was in Judea, which is in the south, and he was headed back to Galilee, up more toward where he was from. Nazareth up in Galilee. But in the middle is Samaria. Now I point that out for this reason. When you go back the Old Testament, when Israel had spent centuries in idolatry and God judged her and the Babylonians and the Assyrians conquered them and most of the people were deported and carried off to Babylon. And really, they only left the poorest of the poor just to farm a little bit. And they imported other people. The Babylonians imported other people that they had conquered to Israel. And so as time went by, you had these few Jews who were left, who were left in Israel, the poorest of the poor. You had some, some other peoples imported in to help take care of the land so the wild animals didn't overrun the place. And as time went by, those people intermarried so that by the time Jesus comes on the scene, Samaritans are despised by any good Jew. And Samaritans are despised because they were considered half-breeds both religiously and ethnically, that they had a little bit of this and they had a little bit of that. Sounds like 21st century America to me. They, they were, they were half-breeds, not only ethnically but religiously. They took a little of this doctrine, and pardon me, but a little of what Oprah said and thought that was the word of God and thought they could base their salvation on that. <clears throat> so that by the time Jesus comes along, if you got to go, if you're a good Jew and you got to go from Judea to Galilee or Galilee to Judea, obviously you can see what the most direct route is. But they hated the Samaritans, so nobody wanted to go through there. So, and understand, you didn't hop in the car, you had to walk. But they were so committed to their prejudice, hello, that they would walk miles out of the way just to bypass Samaria, just to get from one end of Israel to the other. They would walk for miles out of the way. But Jesus comes along, and Jesus says, I got somewhere I need to go, and I'm not going around about skirting the issue. I'm going right where this woman is. I'm going right through Sychar. He was a man of action. If you invested as much in going straight where you need to go as you do in ways to try to get around it, you'd get a whole lot more accomplished. You wear yourself out trying to figure out how you can get around it and still get where you want to be. How can I look like a Christian without really having to devote myself to it? Hello, how can I have a family that looks good while I lay on the couch? I'm preaching better than your amen. I'm telling you right now. We go around, but Jesus is a man of action. Jesus took out, Jesus said, listen, we ain't wasting our time figuring out how to get around it. Baby, we're going right through. We're going right through. And so he breaks he, he, he is a man of action. He goes right where, when it says he needed to go to Samaria and he ends up at Sychar meeting a woman at the well, you understand, he's got this woman's number. This is a setup. He's there on purpose, baby. This is not coincidence. This, How'd I get here 
in this God thing. God took action to get where you were. I tell them one of the things we're starting to see happen, which is a good thing, is whether it's drug recovery or jail or whatever, and we're going to see more of it, but we're starting to run into people in multiple places. The other night, I, normally I just let the, the jail team go, but I went with them just to be supportive, and I walked into a jail cell, 20 or 30 guys in there, and this fellow recognized me. And it's not because I had been there before. <laughs> other than for ministry. But I, I hadn't been there, but I walked in, he recognized me. And he's in jail, and he recognized me because he said, I've been to your church. I went through crossroads. And I was doing pretty good for a while, but I fell off the wagon, so to speak, and here I am. And I, and I had prayer with him, and I said, listen, buddy, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you have run into us at crossroads and you've run into us at jail, God's probably trying to tell you something. God probably has a message for you. See, Jesus, he'll come right where you are. He took action, but I tell you what else he did. He was willing to break with convention. He didn't feel compelled to do what everybody else thought he had to do. See, everybody else is walking miles out of the way. Jesus said, we're going right down Main Street. And he's willing to break with convention, and when the disciples finally find him, not only is he sitting at Sychar at the well with a bunch of Samaritans, he's talking to a woman in public who has a reputation. And so Jesus is willing to break convention. And can I tell you that in our lives, if we follow God, following God means you may not always do what everybody else thinks you ought to do. Your family may not always understand. The world around may not always understand. But if you're going to take action, sometimes you're going to have to break with convention and go where God tells you to go and do what God tells you to do and be who God calls you to be. I want you to understand my heart here. If we're talking about taking action as a church and as a people. And I know how some of you think. Not everybody, but some of you think, why you want to talk about the church? I'm just worried about getting through next week. Can I tell you something? I don't have time to go into all of this. The more that you are committed and a part of God blessing this house, God will bless your house. I'm telling you. The more favor breaks and the more he prospers this house, the more he'll prosper your house when you're a part of it and you get right in the middle of it. Because <laughs> I've been praying recently. And I'm not, you know, people come who are hungry, I can't control all that. But I'm really not after somebody else's members. There was something that came to me and Jennifer a few days ago, and I won't give you any details. But there was a statement that came to us that was made by a health professional in our area. And the statement was this You would be shocked if you knew how many HIV positive people are living in the Tri-County area. And that got a hold of me. And some of you, this may scare you and you may want to go to grabbing up your children. And I guess that's okay. 
But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm praying for that harvest. I've been crying and praying and saying, God, give us a homosexual harvest. Give us a drug harvest. Nobody else wants them, but God, that's a kind of harvest we're throwing our doors open for. Unconventional. Because Jesus, I'm talking about taking action. Jesus took action. And Jesus broke with convention. He broke with convention. And as a result of that, he enjoyed satisfaction. How many of you know there's a satisfaction in doing God's will? Jesus, in fact, draws a comparison and he says, you don't understand this, but he said, actually, my food is to do the will. Not just talk about it, but to do the will of him that sent me. You know, we joke about it sometimes. We don't smoke, dip, chew, or go with girls who do. All the stuff that, all the stuff that the world thinks is fun, we don't do because we're Christians. So you know what we enjoy doing? Eating. We plan our trips around the good places to eat. You want to know the good places to eat in Lexington? Come ask us, baby. We know. Now, some of us, Pam, need a little moderation with some of that because she heads up the health ministry. So some of us need some moderation with some of that. But we enjoy good food. Jennifer, the last year or two, in case you hadn't noticed, has gotten real healthy and gotten a lot of weight off. And so when we eat, she don't take but about three bites of whatever she orders. And, but when we go out to eat, she says, honey, this is expensive. I hate to pay that. I know I can only eat three bites. I said, baby, if you enjoy it, you go ahead. Enjoy it. Now, don't send me any letters or emails, okay? I know there's balance. I understand that. My point is there is nothing better than a good meal when you're hungry. Good food. Jesus said, my food, the thing I really find satisfaction in is when I'm doing what the Father told me to do and I'm taking action and I'm right in the middle of his will. That's what my food is. That's what really brings satisfaction. That's what makes me happy. I'm going to tell you something. I'm your pastor and I love you. But there are some of you, if you aren't careful, you are looking for food in some places that are not going to satisfy. That relationship that is an unbeliever. Well, I, I, need, I want somebody. I'm afraid I'll be left behind. That will not satisfy. You're looking for food in a garbage dump. It will not satisfy. I'm working all the time. I don't have time for anything else. Well, this is what I want to do. Don't even have time for the house of God. If you'll be a part of God prospering this house, he'll prosper your house. Let me touch that one more time. Psalm 127, 28, your blessing comes out of Zion. Don't look for food to satisfy. I, I, I love a good T-bone steak as much as anybody, but I don't want to scrape it off the bottom of a dumpster in order to eat it. <clears throat> 
See, Jesus took action. He broke convention. But he enjoyed satisfaction. The Bible said, because we're trying to find, spending money and trying to find, listen, joy is not in Orlando. I don't care how much you pay to go to the mouse's house. Joy's not in Orlando, and they can tell us all we want, all they want to, that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but you won't find joy there either. Jesus said, my food is in a relationship with the Father doing what he told me to do. Because you take action, you break convention, and you, but you enjoy satisfaction. Can I tell you something? And I'm done with this, I think. We all have our own story of God's grace. We all have our own journey. And sometimes it seems long. And uh, I was praying the other day. You got to understand, I've quit preaching this just testimony. God's been good to me. I was raised in a Christian home where those godly desires were fed and I started preaching when I was 14. And I felt like God put some dreams in my heart. And uh, it's like anybody else. Sometimes that road seems long and hard. I was praying the other day. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me. I'm not saying everything always looks the way we envision, but I, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. I'm 48 years old, and everything in my life up to this point has, has been preparation. And I felt like the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, your season of preparation is over. It's harvest time. And you're about to start reaping in every direction. I came to tell somebody this morning, God spent a long time to get you to this point. Don't blow it now. You don't have time to go around the mountain again. Jesus is coming. He's prepared you for such a time as this. It's time to get up and take action and do something with what God put in you listen to me your real food is not going to be found in in certain relationships it's not going to be found in certain accomplishments or in being recognized by others or by this world Success is not what you do, it's who you are. It's not about what you accomplish, it is about the person that you are becoming. And if you want food, in fact, Psalmist David gave us a promise. He said, I was young, now I'm old. But he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging bread. They always found food. They always found satisfaction in him. You don't have to spend the rest of your life begging bread. You will find what you're looking for in him. It's not a wife. It's not a husband. It's not a six-figure income. 
It's not being on television or in the movies. It's not driving a certain kind of car. It is in a relationship with Almighty God. Stand with me.